Okay. Well, good morning. Glad everybody's here. You survived the snowstorm? Yes, yes. It'll be melted by this afternoon, right? So, okay, we're going to start off this morning a little bit different. Pop quiz time. Don't you love, how long has it been since you had a pop quiz? For me, it's been decades, right? <laughs> pop quiz time. Here's the quiz. We have one, two, three, four, five questions. And I'm going to give you this, you know, 80% passes, right? Okay, here we go. Do you know the guy that wrote Proverbs 30? Can't say yeah. Anybody know him? Agur. Okay, remember that guy, that strange name, Agur. Um, how many of us have read our Bibles prior to two weeks ago and never knew about Agur? Never came to mind, never thought about you. Yep, I'm with you. Never even thought about him until we started the series. Okay, question three. What is the focus and the message that Agur is sharing us with us in Proverbs 30? Any thoughts? Contentment, Contentment right? Finding the right balance in life, having a right relationship with God, about being at peace, right? Uh, number four, how are you doing so far? So-so? Okay. Uh, what are the main verses we've been looking at over the last two weeks through all of Proverbs 30? Now, this one's a little tougher. Do you remember? Which verses out of Proverbs 30 have we been looking at? Very good, very good. I know Kino's paying attention. We'll work on this side of the room later on, right? <laughs> <laughs> Verses 7 and 9, which is the prayer of a girl. Now this one, I think you can get this one. How many prayers are in the entire Old Testament book of Proverbs? <laughs> One. <laughs> this one. This is the only prayer. I'm going to work on my wife later on on the way home. I'll reiterate the messages and say, did you know what your pastor said today? Because he's thinking songs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, I hope you passed the test. We've been going through Proverbs 30 the last two weeks, and we kind of wrap things up today as our third uh, installment in the series of the prayer of Agur. Now, remember, Agur was a simple man. In fact, I love how he starts off in the first couple of verses. He just said, I'm just stupid, right? As he compares himself to God. He wasn't concerned about comparing himself to others, which that's one of the first things that steals our contentment, isn't it? When we start comparing ourselves to others, what did they say back in the 50s and 60s? Well, you got to keep up with the Joneses, the Joneses right? You got to have the white picket fence like they do, the perfect family, the right meatloaf, right? The new refrigerator and all this stuff. Keeping up with the Joneses robs us of our contentment because we're always comparing ourselves to who? To others. And we're never happy with what we have. Agur finds himself in his relationship with, before God and because he realizes the greatness of God and the majesty of God and the meekness of himself and God takes the time to notice him as a man, Agur is tremendously humbled before God and before others. In essence, he doesn't have anything to prove. Wouldn't that be nice? I mean, in my secular job, I deal in sales. Now, one thing in sales is they're always running little promotions and contests. You know why? Because the majority of salespeople always want to be what? The best, the number one, to have their name up there out of all 400 salespeople, they want to be the best. So. A lot of times they're never content because they always need more. They need that bigger sale, that next sale. Well, Agur isn't in that place. He's content in where God has him. He's humble. He's brutally honest in this prayer. As you read the first couple of verses of Proverbs 30, and he appreciates tremendously the miracle and the majesty and the wonder of God's favor upon him. Now, we celebrate that in salvation, but that's truly a miraculous gift. That as we think of this God creator, this person we can't even grasp and, con and, and conceive in our minds and understand, makes time for you and me. That's pretty astounding. When was the last time the Queen of England took time to give you a phone call? When's the last time President Trump or President Biden bothered to send you a text? Anybody? 
When's the last time even Fidel Castro made you a phone call or sent you a letter? Never, right? And yet the God, the creator of not only the world, of all the universe, makes time for you and I each day. As the old hymn states, to walk with us and to talk with us. Quite amazing. So a girl writes this prayer. We'll start off with it because that's the last focus that we have for today is this. Proverbs 30, verses 7 and 9. Here's his prayer. He says, two things I ask of you, Lord. Do not refuse me before I die. Keep me from deception and lies. Keep them far from me. And give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me the food that is my only portion, that I may not be full of and deny to you and say, who is the Lord? Or that I not may be in want and steal and profane the name of my God. Now we start off two weeks ago and we looked at the beginning of this prayer. We're going to kind of reiterate a little bit and kind of wrap it all up. Last week we looked through the entire section of Proverbs 30 and we realized that Agur was this guy after he said this prayer, he kind of made this compilation of six lists, right? List on ways to be close to God, things to do, and a list of what? Things not to do that will destroy that relationship with God. So last week we looked at this as he taught us through these six lists. He kind of gave us six nuggets to hold on to for contentment. One was seek God in his word, right? Always search for God in the Bible and his word and let him speak to you. Because like realizing we've read the Bible before, up until two weeks ago, we didn't even know the name of a girl. What a cool thing, right? We just learned something, isn't that good? We is educated, nice. He also said to seek God's purpose. In other words, not get confused with what all the world says and what you're gonna be when you grow up, but to seek God's purpose in our life, to appreciate God's undefinability, and that if we can define God, if we can box God in, to uh, a standard that we conceive, then he's really not God, is he? Because a God that is definable is not beyond us. Number four, to ponder God's timeline. Because the timing that God works in our life is not the same timing that we have. Number five, to affirm God's authority. In other words, like Agur, to be humble before God, that God is large and in charge and we are to follow. Remember what did Jesus tell those that would be with him to do, his disciples? He said, come and follow me. In other words, Jesus is the leader and we are the followers. And number six, to anticipate God's eternity. That in God's purpose and seeking God's will and learning God's way and appreciating God's wonder and miracle upon us, we are to seek and anticipate God's eternity because in that time we will be with God himself. Now I saved the best for this week with a little reiteration of Agur's prayer in Proverbs 30. This three verse prayer has a shocking formula for trusting God, right? Anybody in here ever have trouble trusting God? Well, God, should I do this or should I do this? What's the future? What should I do, Lord? I mean, I'm in this bind right now and I think I should do this, but your word says this, but I'm not sure that's going to work right now. Maybe a little white lie would be okay, right? We've all kind of said those things. Well, Agur is confronting us with that humility again of putting God in his place and us in our place under him and appreciating that and learning to trust God. So as he prays, he prays just two, a couple quick things. He says, two things I ask of you, Lord. Now, this is amazing to me because he just says, Lord, I'm asking you for two things. That's it. Here's this man coming before the presence of God. And instead of have, having an entire list, he's praying for two things. Now, why is that amazing? Hey, have you ever been in like a, a church function, like a, a big potluck or something? And maybe there's a lot of people or maybe you went to a, a Bible convention or a men's uh, Bible study or women's Bible study and they had the food out you're having a meal and someone said hey would you pray for the meal and the person said absolutely and they start off with this great reverent prayer and they're praying for everything they start by praying for our world and all its leaders and they get to the our country and the president and the cabinet and the senate and and the house 
and all the people in it by name. They work themselves down to our local government, and then they work down to our city and town, and then they pray for all the animals on Noah's Ark that they would be okay, and they pray for the future, and they pray for everything, and they pray, and they pray, and they pray, and an hour and a half later, and after falling asleep and waking up nine times, they say, and God bless the food, amen. <laughs> right? When all they were asked to do was what? Please pray for God's blessing on the food. That's what's nice about a girl. He doesn't go on and on and on. He doesn't get caught up in letting his prayer and his mind and everything just wander, 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 wander. He comes before God and he says, Lord, this is what I pray for. It's very simple. I'm not going to convolute it with all the stuff because if I get this right with you, everything else will what? Fall in line. Again, Jesus reminds us that if we're faithful in what? The small things will be faithful in what? The big things. So if we get the little things right, the basics, then we'll be able to handle the big stuff when it comes. Because the precept of those simple things, those basics, applies to the big things. So he asked for two things of his own personal weakness. One, discerning truth. Anybody have trouble with that? What did Herod, or was it Herod? When Jesus stood before him, he said, he, he said, what is truth? Don't we ask that same question, what is truth? And he also says, here, Lord, I want you to help me not only with discerning truth, but also with materialism, owning stuff. Anybody struggle with that? Okay. First thing is truth. Discerning truth, Agur prays, Lord, I ask you to keep falsehood and lies far from me. Right? Keep deception and lies far from me. In other words, what he's saying, he goes, I know the world is filled with lies. I know it's broken. I, I know there's all this crazy stuff and people trying to convince me of all these things so they can make a personal gain, that they're promising me all this stuff. But Lord, I just want to know what? The truth. Because truth matters, doesn't it? Truth matters. In fact, the Bible, as it speaks of truth, says the truth will set you free. The truth will set you free. You see, truth is not subjective. And what do I mean by that? Truth is not up to our own personal interpretation. There is a biblical, divine, solid truth that is true throughout things. Now, Christy and I, in our warped evenings, like to watch some of these, what do they call them, Hell's Kitchen shows or Kitchen Nightmares. And last night we were watching one with the perfect example. Because here's these people that are running these restaurants and they're failing miserably. So they reach out to this chef and they say, please come and help us. Well, this gal last night had taken, um, in Baltimore, the, Baltimore, there's this common word that they used all the time, and she had taken and patented that word for her own and told all of Baltimore, you cannot use this word or I will sue you. Well, what a nice thing to do, right? Well, Baltimore turned on her. They didn't want to have anything to do with her because they're like, the word was hun. Not like Attila the hun, but like, hey hun, how you doing? Hun, have a nice day. Hun, see you later. So she took and copyrighted that word only for her and threatened to sue everybody. Well, when the chef shows up, he finds out about this. He does a little research. He shows up and he's asking her, what is wrong? And she's going, oh, well, I don't know. All of Baltimore just turned on me. It's just so sad. They just, they're all against me and I just don't understand why. And he goes, well, do you think it's because you took the copyright on that word that they used in the community? Yeah, but you know, I just don't understand why just copywriting a word is such a big thing. He goes, there's nothing else to your story. She goes, no, I don't know why they would be against me. I just copyrighted the word. That's all I did. Kind of the poor me thing. Well, then he confronts her with this thing called what? The truth. And he says, well, I did my research. Didn't you put cease and assist orders against people who had that word in their business? 
Well, 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 you know, you know, maybe a little bit. Didn't you legally threaten people to sue them if they used that word that you copyrighted? Well, maybe, but just a little bit. He goes, no, you did or you didn't. So she tried to candy coat things, right? But the truth was she tried to take legal action against the city for a word that they used all the time. You know, kind of going to the old mom and pop diner and they bring up your, your chicken fried steak and they're like, oh, enjoy, hon, have a good day. Well, she would legally go after people for doing that. The truth was the only thing to set her free and bring everything out in the open. And again, truth is not subject subjective. It's not up to our interpretation. The truth, especially of God's word, is the truth because it says God nor his word is the same when yesterday today and tomorrow in fact in the book of Revelation in the last chapter it promises that nothing out of God's word will be taken out or replaced in other words that is one thing that is solid in our life just as God is solid and as we've said before, wouldn't it be crazy to serve a God that changed his mind all the time? That would drive us nuts because we would never know if we're in salvation or not. Now, Satan, as he's called in the Bible, the father of lies, lies has tried to destroy and warp the truth clear back from Genesis in the Garden of Eden and ever since then. You know, telling you, well, that little white lie is okay because it kind of made people feel good, right? Well, it just kind of helped things going, well, you know, I'm working for a big business, so that taking of that thing, that really won't hurt anybody, will it? The truth will set us free. Part one of Agur's prayer for contentment is admitting his brokenness before his creator. He knows he lives in a broken world. He knows that he is a broken man, and he asks God to help him with that. He says, Lord, show me truth, that I may live truth and know truth and speak truth and do truth. So, first application for us in Agar's prayer for practical application is, truth matters. Do you want the truth in your life? Or do you want to live in a world of deception and lies? In Agar's prayer, it's about truth. Now, the second thing he prays is about balance. In other words, I call it dealing with owning <coughs> stuff. Anybody in here have stuff? Anybody have more than a roof over your head and enough food for the day? Nobody? A couple of you? Have stuff? I mean, how many of you walked in with enough layers of stuff you had to take stuff off to be comfortable in the roof over your head where the heater's going on? Stuff. Owning stuff. Edgar prays this after dealing with the truth, the second struggle in his life. He says, give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. New American Standard doesn't say only. NIV version says only, but only is a key word. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Okay, second pop quiz of the day. You ready? How many of you passed pop quiz number one? Ken did. Okay, yeah, he's the only one. This is the good side of the room. We'll work on this side, right? So we'll say for a second sermon on this side, can you give, take a free pass today? How many of us live and desire and aim for moderation? We should, right? That's what Agur's prayer is about, about moderation. Lord, make me not poor, but Lord, I don't need to be rich either. I want that balance in life, Lord. Not too much one way or another. You see, we live in today's society in a world of instant gratification, but more than that, we live in a world of extremes, don't we? Extremes, right? I mean, how many people 20, 30 years ago would be walking around with pink hair and purple hair and uh, white hair and all this stuff. I mean, we have all these expressions of things and everyone has to go to the extreme to express themselves because that's who I am, right? No, not necessarily. We want this attitude of bigger is what? Bigger is better. More houses, 
bigger houses, more cars, nicer, newer cars. In fact, most people now don't own, they just lease. We want more closet space to put more stuff in, right? You see the movie stars and they walk in, they have an entire room just for their shoes. Now, Christy kind of drools at that, but luckily God holds That's her back. Moderation. Moderation. That's moderation, exactly. yeah. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> we want more shelves for more trophies. We want more activities, more responsibility for who we are. We want more, more, more. And more leads to only a desire for one thing. What? More. more. The more we have, the more we want, right? And then we find we're one of those people on the PBS show, The Hoarders, because we've got so much we can't even get through our own house, right? On the flip side, there's another extreme, and it's very common in today's society. Anybody ever hear of minimalism? Isn't that a common thing out now? I mean, maybe you know someone or you've seen a, a program where it's like, let's cut up our credit cards, let's get rid of all the clutter, let's just give to DI or Goodwill, get rid of all of it except for what we need, and all oh, we don't need the latest gadgets, we don't need to fill our wardrobe, we just need enough. In fact, let's get a tiny little container and live in that container and only what we can have in that container because that's the way to be happy. Well, we have people living in micro apartments and tiny homes, not because that's all they can afford, but because they choose to, and that's going to make them happy. Well, where do we get these two extremes? More and minimalism. To me, when we live these lives, anybody ever remember the old game of pinball, right? The little silver ball, you shoot it out, it goes to the top, and what does it do? It comes down and hits all the bumpers, and it goes to this side, and this side, and this side, and this side, hitting all the bumpers all over, and you got your flippers on the bottom, and all you're trying to do is to keep that ball what? In play, in the machine to keep it going up, but what does the ball keep doing? It keeps going down, 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 until oh, it's gone. And that's kind of like the two extremes. That's what a guru is trying to tell us is, if you live in this extremism of always having to have more, 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 or you go the other side where it's like, well, I just have to give up everything and kind of live like a monk, right? Neither one of those are necessarily good. There's balance somewhere in the middle. Quick history lesson. The men and women who grew up in the Great Depression and fought World War II became known as the greatest generation of our American nation. When they started their families after World War II, they were the first people to buy TVs, a second car, a house in the suburbs, to do things faster, having an interstate road to travel on, commercial jet liners to fly on, digital dial telephones, and fast food restaurants, McDonald's and others. They were the first to do that. Now the interesting thing is their motivation was not greed. You know what their, most of their motivation was? to make things better for who? Their children. That's what their desire was. Now their children from this greatest generation, the boomers, remember the boomers? Most of us in here except for one are boomers, right? Well, we rebelled for a little while because our parents just didn't take good enough care of us. And then we picked up and we decided that, hey, having all this stuff, a taste for bitter, bigger, better, faster, busier, more expensive, was good. And here's the reality. When you look back at the boomer generation, now we've come into several new generations, were those people necessarily more happy than anybody else? They were constantly trying to acquire stuff, not necessarily to make things better for their kids, but to keep up with the Joneses and show everybody else how much they had. You know? So Agur is not encouraging minimalism, nor is he encouraging affluence as success, but he's saying there's a balance in there. Remember his prayer? Give me neither poverty nor riches. When he wrote this chapter, I think the people of a time, as we talked about two weeks ago, would relate with one event. Remember the exodus out of Egypt? 
and God provided manna on a how often basis? Daily basis, except for the Sabbath, and he gave us enough for two days. They would remember that, because if they took too much, what happened to it in the morning, as the Bible states? If they tried to hoard it and keep more, they would wake up and it was wormy and rotten and gross. God wanted them to depend on him on a daily basis. In the New Testament, we would remember the Lord's Prayer where it says, Give us this day our daily bread. In other words, not enough for all time, but just enough, Lord, to get through today and then to depend upon you for the next day and then depend upon you for the next day. What God is working at here in this balance is a relationship with God that God is the provider, God is sufficient, God is enough in what he gives us. Now the interesting thing when you look at the NIV version of this prayer is that Gur puts a key word in there. He says, give me only my daily bread. Only my daily bread. In other words, God, just give me enough to make it through the day, but to keep my dependence upon who? Upon God. Because he knows if he has too much, he may just forget God. Because when you're affluent, you have everything you need. Let's say you win this $970 million lottery and you get $450 million to live on. Well, you can just spin, spin, spin. Why do you need God when you have $450 million and you can buy whatever you want? You can buy an island, you can buy a country, you can buy a town. Well, I don't need God because look at all I have. And Agur says, Lord, don't make me that way. But on the other end, he says, Lord, don't make me have to live out of a cardboard box. Don't make me so desperate and poor that I might choose to steal just to get by today and profane your name. Agur's prayer is give me only what I need for the day. And then, Lord, when I wake up in the morning, my contentment, my relationship is to, tend, to depend upon you once again and trust in you. Isn't that a good thing? Isn't that a good thing? God says, I want you to trust me, to not be anxious. In fact, in the New Testament, Jesus talks about the lilies of the field and the birds of the air, and God cares for them. And he says, how much more, if I love you more than them, how much more will I care for you just to give you enough for today? Now, there are so many people worrying about how much they'll have in their last years, right? There are other people who are worrying about how they'll get through their last years because they have nothing. And God says, follow my precepts, trust me, and we'll get there. In essence, what Agur is hitting on is the love of things. You know, in 1 Timothy 6.10, we always think about, well, money is the root of all evil, right? Don't we think about that? Money is the root of all evil. In other words, possessions and stuff, money is the root of all evil. Well, if that were true, does that mean God would hate rich people? That would, because they have a lot of stuff, right? They have more than we do. Well, sometimes we like to hate them because they have more than we do, but God doesn't hate them. In fact, Jesus hung around rich people all the time. It's not bad to be rich and wealthy and to have a lot of money. What the Bible actually says in 1 Timothy 6.10 is this. The love, the desire of money is the root of all evil. In other words, when our heart is corrupt and we desire more, 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 instead of desiring that relationship with God, that's what messes it up, right? It's the love of money because clear back in Deuteronomy, in the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, God tells us that he is a jealous God and will have none other before him. In other words, he won't have us loving money and stuff or other people more than him. His desire for us is to love him. First Timothy goes on to say this. It says, those who have chosen to love money more than God it says some people craving money have wandered from their true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. You know the problem with having a lot of stuff? You got to store it, you got to take care of it, and you got to protect it because everybody else what? Wants it, right? 
That's the problem with having all that stuff, is your mind shifts from being content in relationship with God to how am I going to store and keep this? How am I going to protect it? And how am I going to keep it mine? You see where the imbalance is? Jesus doesn't say minimalism. You don't have to make yourself suffer and go without but you don't need to live in abundant excess either. There's a balance right in the middle. In fact, the Apostle Paul reiterates this in the New Testament in Philippians. Philippians 4, verse 12. The Apostle Paul states this. I know what it is to be in need. Can we relate with that? Anybody in this room ever been in need? Gone hungry? Gone without? Had your five, six big brothers, big sisters, hand-me-downs? We saw a comedian last night, he talked about having the hand-me-downs from several generations. He goes, by the time I got my underwear, there was no elastic left in it. It was terrible. It just didn't stay up, right? How many of us have been in that position where we just get the hand-me-downs or the clothes from other people and we just go without? Paul says, I know what it is to be in that place. He also says, I know what it is to have plenty. How many of us relate with that? We live lives where we have plenty. We always have food. In fact, right now, in your home or your church, there are snacks and food and things waiting for you over and above just giving you a meal, right? We know that. Paul says, I have learned, and that's key. Contentment is a learned trait. He, is, he says, I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. So Paul tells us what the Gur is trying to tell us back in Proverbs 30. He says contentment is something you learn to do. Now, how many of you have ever learned something in your life? That's a silly question, isn't it? We've all learned something, whether good or bad. But did you just suddenly have a eureka moment and you knew something? I mean, it just came to you, a bright light appeared, and boom! You were instantly intelligent and knew everything, right? No, you had to learn it. Does a baby just know once it comes out and the baby's two days old how to communicate and talk in five languages and how the stock market works? No. A newborn baby doesn't even know how to get around, how to feed itself, how to care for itself. All the newborn baby knows is this, and it doesn't know how it works, but it knows this, stuff comes in and stuff goes out. And when it doesn't work, you cry, right? A newborn baby has to learn to first sit up, and then to what? To crawl, and then to walk, and then to run. And how long does it take? Does it happen in a week? Does it happen in a month? takes years, right? And as we grow, we continue to learn. In fact, I love hearing people I saw a documentary over in, in like Italy where they have this population of the most centurions in the world, the most hundred year old plus people. And their comments were, there's always more to what? To learn. We've been here 110 years and there's more to learn. Learning is a process. And this issue of contentment, of being in a right relationship with God, is something we learn over time. It's settling in to having confidence in God supplying for us. It's not us going out and just making things happen, but following God's purpose and being content in Him, success or failures. You see, here's the crazy thing. God is not impressed in your position, or your bank account, or your influence with other people. God is not even concerned about the brand names on your clothing, or your car, or your jewelry, or your wallet, or anything. In fact, from God's perspective, it's okay to have a few dandelions in your yard. Now, personally, that drives me crazy. But then I remember God created the dandelions. Why? I don't know. Kind of like mosquitoes. I don't know where that comes in, but they're there for a reason, right? God doesn't care if your kid doesn't go to Harvard. God doesn't care if your car has a few rust spots on it. If your cabinets squeak a little bit. 
In fact, to bring this clear to home, when God sent his only begotten son to save the world, did he put him in riches? Where did God put his son? He was birthed in poverty. Born in the poverty in a barn with an animal feeding trough for a crib. Now when we think about that, do you think God's really impressed by what brand name clothes you wear? What style shoes you wear? What kind of leather your wallet's made of or your purse? No. Is God saying those things are wrong? No. What he's saying is, don't let your focus be on those things. If you can afford those things, that's wonderful. If God's blessed you in that, that's wonderful. But don't let the acquisition of those things be the focus of your life. Bouncing through life's guardrails, if we go to either extreme, riches or poverty, we're going to miss it, right? It's the balance in the middle of appreciating what we have, who we have, and whose we are right now. Not needing to add to that. Now, I'm not saying it's not wrong to advance yourself, because again, as the Apostle Paul said, I've learned this contentment. God says there's much to learn, but I want you to learn my ways, my truth. It's not up to your opinion. It's not up to your subjectivity, but I want you to learn it. Why? So that we will be what in God? Content, at peace, happy, trusting. You know, I'll tell you what, in the sales job, there's always the push to do more right? More new accounts, selling more business, penetrate that account more, get more profit, more, 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 more. And it's a constant battle. And I know when my mind track gets set on that, you know what I do at night? It's not sleep. What am I doing? The wheels are churning in my head on how I'm going to accomplish this, how I'm going to do that, what kind of tactic I can think to do that. And I'm not at peace, and I'm not resting, and I'm not content. How about you? You ever had that? Where something's out there and you're thinking, well, how am I going to do this? What do I got to do? And your mind is racing all night long. And are you at peace? No. No. We need to learn to be content in God. Remember, as the Bible says, you already are, not will be, not has been, you already are God's workmanship. God has already handcrafted you from birth. He's placed his own fingerprints upon you as he says in the Old Testament how he's molded you while you were yet in your mother's womb. And he created you for a purpose. He made you exactly the way he wanted you. It's like he made you that perfect piece of the puzzle that just fills in and completes the entire puzzle. You know what I'm talking about? You ever have a jigsaw puzzle? You get to the very end and there's one piece. What? missing? God says, I created you to be that piece to fill that void in, to make the picture complete. So we close with this. Four thoughts on how to learn to be content in God. Number one, realize you cannot do all things all the time. You cannot do all things all the time. In fact, God says, I do want you to work Here's my precept. Work for six days, and then what on the seventh? Rest. And God is so adamant about that, that he did that himself. He says, I'll show you by example how to do that. I'll create the world and the universes in six days, and on the seventh day, the Bible says, God rested. There's a time for everything, as Ecclesiastes says. A time to work and a time to rest. But realize, you can't do it all. I think about that in the aspect of parenthood. You know, having your first child, wanting to be the perfect parent. You know how well I did that? I think day one or day two I failed, right? I can't be the perfect parent because I'm not perfect. We can't do all things all the time. Number two, manage yourself, not your time. 
we have calendars and day timers and all these things to manage our time. What we need to do is manage ourselves. How many of us have 24 hours in a day? Anybody have 26? 22? We all have what? The exact same amount of time. So God says manage what you do in that time. Again, have time to work, to be diligent, but also make time to rest. That's important to rejuvenate you. Manage yourself. Number three, realize it's okay to say no sometimes. You don't have to do it all. It's okay to say no. Number four, live in the purpose of God's will. And that's the most important. God created you for a purpose. He created you in his will. He says, don't strive after poverty and don't strive after riches and be truthful, but live in my will. And that's how we learn to be content in God, to realize where we start today and how we apply that and where we go from here. So with that, let's pray and let's go forth this week and apply what we've learned from this Old Testament prophet about what it is to be content in God. Lord, we thank you again for the day. We ask your blessing upon it. We pray, Lord, as we go forward, we would see all the abundance you have blessed us with, that we would fight the spiritual battle of comparing ourselves to others and only put our place before you, that we would realize we don't have to prove anything to anybody. The only person we have to appease and prove anything to is you. And that's the dedication of our love and our desire to be in relationship with you and our willingness to let you lead and we follow and apply your words to our life. Lord, I pray for all of us who see or hear this message that we would learn from this Old Testament prophet to learn to be content in you, to be honest about ourselves, about others, about everything, and to not desire extremes, but to live in balance that you and you alone provide for us day to day as we trust in you. In Jesus' name, God's people said, Amen. Amen.